Hey there, it's Natalie, and I'm here in Karamoja, which is a large dry land and pastoral area within northern Uganda that borders Turkana on the Kenya side. And we're here in this area where we have a collection of manyatas, which are enclosed homesteads where cattle, shoats, sheep, goats are kept. And then inside of that, you have the homes of families. So um, these are the traditional way of cattle keeping and moving, you know, uh, that nomadic pastoralists have been moving and establishing homesteads across the region, uh, but increasingly becoming more settled. I won't get into that, but basically we're here um, outside of Moroto town in Karamoja and we're uh, where we have about 12 large manyatas that are all uh, together here in a large community and it's about five, five, uh, between five and 6,000 uh, people total. So um, we are thinking about doing, you know, how can you do very small scale micro gardens and food uh, you know, micronutrient-rich foods in this type of context. And so uh, we're here and looking at different types of solutions. So I'm specifically making this video, um, especially for our team here, our WFP team, uh, to kind of document some types of solutions that uh, would, would be appropriate in this context. So I'm here with our team and we are entering inside this manata. Morning. So the, traditionally there's a, an entry where you'll have people, animals coming through. And uh, between here, you know, between the outer fence, which is for protection of animals, especially from predators, uh, and then you have the, the homesteads where people live. So oftentimes this is where food is grown. And I'm, uh, oh, here, Joyce is talking about the, the manyata, arra manyata yeah the setting. manyata setting and how homes are arranged um, but what i wanted to focus on here is the number of resources we have so many huge resources here so a lot of trees are cut uh, for the fencing and you have all this natural material that's gathered from the local area for fencing and making the you know the outer boundary but we have huge amounts of manure i mean ma this is like the manure mecca. It is a huge, huge collection of animal manure. We have lots of carbon. So a lot of times after the thatching is done on houses and is spent, after years it needs to be replaced. Uh, so there's just lots of brushy material, carbon, organic matter um, all throughout, which is a big opportunity. And we'll come back out here and talk about this in a minute. So, as we enter here, uh, you can see where, you know, the animals are the absolute more, most precious asset. And so, they're often kept, you can see this pile of manure for goats. So, goats, cattle are kept inside the manata um, to protect them from lots of thorny things around here. So you've got goats that are tied in these little pins, and then here you have the logs that the cows are changed to at night. So this is, you know, this hop happens because of predators, to, and not only predators, but cattle raiders and other communities that may come and steal cattle. So uh, the cattle are kept here at night, and the goats are around. Um, so there's a very direct and intimate relationship with animals. But again, the amounts of manure here are totally massive. So Jimmy and Joyce, Jimmy and Joyce, do you want to uh, take us back to where you've tried to make the keyhole garden? Yes. Okay. So this is Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. And Joyce from WFP. Yes, please. <laughs> um, are you? Oh, on this side, yes. So, um, this community is actually agro-pastoralist and they grow sorghum and uh, sometimes we'll grow some small green vegetables. So here we're just trying to look at where that might fit in already into the context of the homes. So this is inside the manata. 
And, you know, one thing I love here is they've got ducks. They have pigeons. They have chickens. Uh, this is a granary. So this is where... Oh, and a turkey. <laughs> so these are where grain stalks are kept. Uh, so the surplus harvest is kept in these structures. And we've got several of them. They're empty at the moment. But Jimmy, you want to just show us quickly this keyhole garden? So Jimmy here tried to make um, a keyhole garden that he... Uh, Joyce was helping to translate a few days ago. Yeah, this place is completely baking hot in the in the middle of the day. And this is where he was trying to grow a few vegetables and was not successful. So um, the other day when we were here, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. And that was a really great time to see where you have shade in the afternoon that is protected from the west sun, which is the hottest sun of the day. If we were to pretend that this is the afternoon right now, you know, from a design perspective, when we're doing small space food systems, we really have to be shade hunters. And what I mean by that is already right now, at this time of day, you can see already, let's pretend it's the afternoon and it's baking hot. Shade, 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 shade. So that along these edges around these shady areas is where you can start to do very, very small scale uh, micro gardens. So for example, here, you know, and there are animals here, uh, ducks, chickens, turkeys. So this was one area that we had identified, for example, you know, if I lived here, you already have the area, you know, fencing. Um, they just use this as a storage area, but I would block off this area here with some of these materials and designate this area of fencing because this area here that stays shaded and cool throughout the day, even though it's eight in the morning, even this area was shaded. So here I would do tiny double dug beds. What I mean is, and you can even do it on contour, you can see what maybe you can see uh, the slope is heading this way. And by the way, we do have a shower area. So. This is an area that you can see has collection of water. You know, I would do just this tiny, maybe square meter or on contour, double dug beds, 60, 70 centimeters deep, packed full of all that manure and extra carbon materials that we're seeing, the, uh, the spent grasses and sticks and twigs, put that in there, return the soil and use the same uh, carbon material to mulch and at least here you can have some local vegetables, also be GDB, dodos, amaranths, the, the African leafy green vegetables, those indigenous uh, vegetables. And this whole entire area, at least during the rainy season, could become much, much more viable. Also doing beans up the walls. You can even do pumpkins over the top. So identifying these tiny little niche areas, you know, this could really be a significant source of supplemental greens for the family. And we we saw a number of opportunities like that through here. I unfortunately, <laughs> um, uh, Jimmy and the family here don't speak English, so uh, it's a bit hard to have them directly explain. And I'm trying to keep these videos a bit short, so I'm just running through and uh, trying to explain everything directly. But this is another area. So this is an area that's used for seeding. Uh, but, you know, just creating this type of structure, this protected little greenhouse would be a perfect place to have, you know, greens growing. So again, double dug in dry land context like this, do not do vertical growing systems. OK, no sat gardens, no tower gardens, no keyhole gardens, because two things, when you have those vertical systems, um, you know, they can evaporate from all sides, right? From every direction you have evaporation. It's very difficult to retain moisture. And on top of that, they can't collect acidic rainwater, which chillates the soil and creates biomineral, you know, I mean, bioavailability of minerals into the, uh, into the soil, right? So you have to be able to catch that rainwater. I'm going to walk back out, Joyce. I'm going to walk back to the area where the sorghum is. So 
Hi, puppy. So there are just so many resources here. I mean, all of the ingredients for resilience are right here. We also have quite a bit of clay soil, so you could easily do a depression for the ducks um, to collect water for them. Right now, they're drinking water out of a gourd, but you know, they would like to be splashing and... Um, so yeah, I mean, this place, if you've got the right glasses on, this is really a paradise of nutrient, of resources. Where, how do we go back to the entrance where the uh, sorghum field was that we looked at yesterday? So, goat manure, cow manure, ducks, they also keep pigeons. That was really exciting for me because uh, they have a little pigeon house and People traditionally eat pigeon here. That's totally acceptable culturally, which is great because that's also an amazing source of phosphorus. So people throughout history um, in North Africa, Middle East, have kept really elaborate pigeon houses made of cob, you know, these earthen structures and other structures that look like pigeon palaces. Morning, how are you? So, uh, oftentimes you can put a pigeon house in the middle of your farm and they just freely are wild and come in and out, but they're pouring fertility all over the, the uh, farm. So here what I wanted to point out is that this is an area uh, where sorghum is grown in this band between the where the cattle are kept and the outer uh, barrier. So here, you know, I think, you know, when you have areas of high animal traffic, it's challenging to do contiguous structures like swales to really spread because they get trampled and they get weak points and they can break the berm and that can cause erosion and gullies. So you really have to be careful about doing those contiguous uh, passive water harvesting earthworks like very long swales. But even here, if we did giant half moons, mini, mini swales, so many different types of, uh, you know, passive water harvesting earthworks, we don't really have stones for stoneworks very much here. But let's just say even big giant half moons like WFP does in the, has done in the Sahel and all over, where you can do a big half moon and and then infiltration pits within that and xi pits and external xi pits. So here you can actually be doing tons of sorghum and I would do it with a three sisters method. So traditionally here people do grow sorghum maize um, with beans. Uh, they also grow sunflower for oil and for snacking. So I would definitely do three sisters, sorghum, beans, pumpkins, melons, um, so that you have tons of ground cover and make sure that we are using a lot of what people consider, you know, whatever weeds, wild grasses, use those as mulches and really build a deep bed mulch system here. And then you can do super biointensive. If you have deep bedding of mulch and manure, then you can even be planting that sorghum with 25 centimeters uh, spacing. Here people broadcast, which is fine, but even if you do giant passive water harvesting moons and such such structures you would catch a lot of water and really build stop erosion you know slow down erosion here and be able to create a very very fertile system so uh, half moons on a fish scale pattern that's a um you know a fractal pattern so that it's cascading and spilling from one to the next the other issue here is the flooding so we are on a slope um going down here and this area is sort of the social this is the town square this is the piazza of this of this maniata village so this is where cultural dances take place this is where kids play football and the this is just the communal gathering area so you can't come in here and do a giant anything um but what you can do is along this you can kind of see a bit of a a band that's a little bit green where uh, it's not as trafficked but here I would do giant you know half moons or other structures trapezoidal buns 
uh, to catch a lot of that nutrient running off of the manata and all that manure. And you can do trees here. That's another thing here is we really don't have a lot of trees and uh, animals need trees. Cows are forest people. They originated in the cows in the valleys of Syria. That's where they come from as a species. So if you want cows to produce more milk, they need to be shaded and cooled. Um, so adding some trees in and around the area. So although uh, the Karmajong are pastoralists, these communities are, you know, have been here and settled for an extended period of time, plenty of time to grow trees. So uh, culturally, that's not something that necessarily happens within the Manyata, but there are people who are interested in trying to do that. So for animals, I would definitely try to provide shade wherever possible. Anyway, you know, big half moons here or trenches where you know, you can do a swale that's off contour as long as the bottom is level. So let's say even though this is going downhill, you would, you could dig a swale or a trench or kind of a, you know, trenchy swale, whatever you want to call it, and just make sure the bottom is level. So what that means is that here it would be deeper and then it would become more shallow because this slope goes this way. So I would do that here. I would do another band uphill this way to catch runoff before it hits those manatas and then beyond up above this entire manata is where you can do larger swales you know uh, to direct runoff away from the manata because it definitely gets flooding in there and it just becomes a big sopping mess with all that manure and the cows so yeah up above you know around even here i mean everywhere I, everywhere that you don't have animal traffic or foot traffic and it's super important to be designing for the users of the space who are the users of the space it's cows goats ducks turkeys chickens animals babies uh, adults so not a lot of vehicles um you know coming in and out of the manata so those are the users of the space that you have to design for so yeah, this video is mainly for our team just to get a sense of the types of small scale uh, hand-based earthworks that could be dug to support the families here to increase micronutrients with leafy green vegetables, make their sorghum uh, growth more viable and integrate more uh, nutrition and diversity into the diet and maybe even you know something for market, pumpkins and sorghum for market in addition, including beans as well. And then some small scale flood mitigation measures just to retain that water, you know, longer and increase the growing season, extend the growing season, make it more, you know, the growing of sorghum more viable in an area that's increasingly desiccating and getting hotter and hotter. So um, that's it. That's my little video on this sort of sponge manata vision, uh, which is super doable with very few resources using only locally available free on-site resources, the manures, the carbons, organic materials, and just making some tiny little micro gardens in the, all the shaded microclimates. And that could really boost, in addition to the meat and sorghum, the vegetables that they like to eat but don't really have access to. So those are my thoughts. Hope that helps. Thanks.